Hey Audiophiles, Fernando from SkyFi Audio. Today we got something pretty cool in the shop. Well, I've said that a pretty much four or five times this month. So once again, we've gotten some pretty neat uh, piece of equipment here in our shop. And these happen to be a set of MBL 101Es. Um, they call it a radial stroller. Um, I suspect it's because of the unconventional uh, radial nature of the um, mid and tweeters. So um, this came from a, 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 an owner in Pennsylvania um, who had these set up. He's moving out of the country. He was sad to see these go, but we were happy to take them in. Um, the um, 101Es came out in 2000, early 2000s, and I believe they graced the cover stereophile in uh, 2004. And uh, I just went online. I saw uh, a great review by our friend Michael Fremer, who's a local reviewer uh, for stereophile. And I went through it pretty quickly uh, to familiarize myself with it. I do remember seeing these on the cover of Stereophile, mostly because they're so unusual um, in design and execution, but they're our work of art, and we're so happy to have them here. So over the next, uh, over this video, I'm gonna go over some of the technology. I'm gonna test these. I suspect there is uh, an issue with uh, one or several of the drivers. So we're gonna have to dive in and do some repairs. But overall, I'm pretty pleased with the condition. The, the silver finish on the cabinets is pretty cool. It goes well with the aluminum um, surface on the mid-ranges. The grills are painted in silver as well. And it is a striking speaker, uh, as you can see. Just imagine, we'll assemble this at some point down the road, but those are the grills. So this thing's going to probably stand about six feet tall when we're done with it. They came in these massive crates, so which is awesome. It'll give us the ability to ship them anywhere in the world once we get them sorted out. So stay with me, and uh, we'll uh, we'll dive into these uh, to these speakers over time. All right, ready to go over some of the specifications on the MBLs. But before I go any further, if you like these videos and you enjoy what we're doing, please uh, subscribe and like to our videos. It'll keep us motivated, um, but only do it if you think it's worth it. So the MBL-101Es are a four-way speaker. So inside of this cabinet is a 12-inch woofer, uh, probably pretty conventional woofer. We'll get a look at it at some point. Just above it is a lower mid-range. This football-shaped um, device is essentially um, has a conventional voice coil, but the radiating surface is uh, composed of these 12 aluminum panels that sort of compress up and down. So the, imagine the voice coil sitting underneath this and, and essentially compressing these surfaces to make them radiate, which is a really neat execution for, for sound. So uh, 12 inch, I'm sorry, 12 uh, individual segments on the lower mid-range, then moving on to this carbon fiber uh, upper mid-range tweeter, I'm sorry, upper mid-range driver, another 12 um, segments on there with the magnet structure being uh, below it, actually, you can actually sort of see the voice coil, the copper from the voice coil in there. So this must be compressing in this orientation. And then up above, we've got the tweeter. The tweeter seems to have the magnet inverted. And this is 24 segments, also carbon fiber. Really neat layout. And we've got a top logo MBL on the top. Um, down below, we've got some uh, pretty unusual acrylic grills. Uh, sitting here, I guess this sort of gives the the grill something to attach to or, or to go into, or maybe it's hiding part of the magnet structure down there. Cabinets are a weird shape. They're somewhat sizable. And these are uh, by wire speakers. I see that we've got terminals here for uh, the mid and the highs. Got a bunch of settings here in the in the middle. Let's see, we've got low and mid, um, smooth attack. So I think we were able to dial in the, the tweeter and the, the mid-range drivers as we please. And then down below, we've got a single set of binding posts for the woofer. So we'll try this both ways. We'll try it with a single channel of amplification, and then we'll try them with, uh, actually, we may not be able to. We're, we'll, we'll see. More about this. More about this later. Now, I did notice in the specifications that 
um, they're pretty power hungry. I think they're 81 dBs, which is as, as the l pretty much the lowest efficiency we've seen in, in quite some time. So it is no surprise that they came with a set of pass, I think the Model X 600 amplifiers. These are original holy grail amplifiers from Pass Labs and probably very carefully selected to work with these MBLs. All right, so um, next we're gonna move on to, to testing the speaker. So we're gonna hook it up to uh, in our lab and, and see what how the drivers are performing individually. Uh, we should be able to get that tested pretty quick. Okay, we've made it over to the test bench and uh, I put the MBL 101s on carts so we can move them around as they do with almost everything in the shop and roll them over to the tech area. Um, so this is my bench. Um, we're gonna focus mostly on this uh, frequency generator from Siglent. I've got it uh, doing a sweep frequency between 35 hertz and uh, see 4.4K. Need to raise that a bit. So I'm going to go to 20k. Turn on the output. All right, that's what you hear in the background. So this is a standard testing procedure for speakers. It allows us to kind of get a sense of the entire frequency range. Um, and these MBLs, I've connected both sets of inputs in parallel. So coming out of my amplifier, which is on that patch panel over there, I'm coming into one of the inputs, and then I'm daisy chaining over to the low frequency input, just out of convenience, so I don't have to run two separate channels. In the middle here, we've got a bunch of jumpers that they provide to dial in the amount of uh, low, mid, and tweeter response you want. I'll go more into exactly what that means. Uh, it's pretty particular what they've done. But for testing purposes, uh, pulling those bridging clips allows me to disconnect certain drivers. Um, the first thing I notice is the bass is pretty low and, uh, and pretty steady. So I think we've got a, a good bass driver. Don't know how much you can hear of the, of the sweep. Let me turn it up. I've got a slight rattle right around 1K, or just below that. So I'll have to investigate. It's coming from this driver here. So I'll have to sort of dial in on the exact frequency and make sure it's not resonance or something else vibrating. You can often be tricked into thinking you've got a bad driver. And also, all it is is that uh, the driver is actually exciting some other uh, item. And it could be anywhere. It could be on your workbench, it could be a light fixture, it could be a shade. So I'll isolate that frequency. And But as I went further, I noticed that I'm not getting anything from this mid-range. I'm definitely hearing it from the super tweeter or the high frequency driver, from, but nothing from the upper mid. Um, and then close inspection yields the fact that I, I see some sort of uh, oil here. It's probably ferrofluid oil that has leaked out of the driver. So for sure, we're gonna have to get uh, this driver rebuilt. It's no big deal, MBL is, is well supported here in the US, so we will send uh, this out to get redone. All right, on to the second speaker. I'm gonna go ahead and connect it off camera that you don't have to watch me fumble around. All right, second speaker connected and this one is even in worse condition. Um, by condition, I mean operating. I do not hear the lower mid-range, uh, nor I hear the, the tweeter up high. So I pulled the lead out of the tweeter to get a reading on it, and sure enough, I've got zero or an open uh, circuit for the voice coil in the tweeter. Mid-range is working well, and this one is not leaking. I don't see any signs of oil or any residue coming from it. So we know what a good working low upper mid-range sounds like. And the lower mid-range, um, I did notice one thing. Uh, let me 
put this in a static frequency so I can show you what I mean. So if I change this from sweep to steady, and I lower the frequency, say to let's say 200k or 200 hertz. Turn up the volume. And then I'm going to disconnect the upper frequencies so I'm not fooled by it. I did notice that if I press just in the right spot, right over here, right about here, it starts to work. So I'm not quite sure what these rods do, whether they're just reinforcement for this aluminum membrane or whether or not they're conductive, I'm gonna have to figure out. But um, hopefully this is just a matter of getting in there. And uh, doing a small adjustment. And if not, we'll just send that lower base, or lower mid-range out as well. Um, luckily, um, they're in really nice physical condition, both of these lowered mid-ranges. If you go online and you try to buy a set of MBLs, whether it's the 101E or earlier versions, inevitably you're going to find dents on this very fragile aluminum piece and one of these 12 segments. Uh, luckily, we've got really nice clean segments, so I suspect that we'll just have to um, do this quick repair here and then rewind uh, or replace the the upper mid-range so that's it for this segment we're going to get a hold of mbl so you can kind of see what processes we go through in order to make sure our clients are not disappointed when they get something as spectacular as this product so we'll um we'll circle back it'll probably be a few weeks on this one once we've got replacement drivers or at least once we know the direction we're going we don't expect these to be inexpensive to fix um, and luckily we were careful with the purchase, um, so I think we'll probably end up doing fine after all. So uh, thanks for watching and we'll come back to you uh, not far from today. Um, again, this is Fernando from SkyFi Audio. Uh, you can visit us online at skyfiaudio.com or um, check us out on Instagram. And if you like the videos, please go ahead and subscribe. Thanks for watching, guys. Okay, so to troubleshoot a bit further, I've gone and removed the top section of the speaker. Uh, here you see the lower mid-range. It was just a matter of removing four screws and unsoldering the connections. Going to the upper mid-range and the tweeter, you can see there are two wires, one dedicated for each of the two drivers, and then some sort of sticky material here to form a good tight seal, as well as a, a bit of a foam substance on the perimeter. So upon closer inspection, it's pretty straightforward. This will allow me to test for continuity at the right spots to make sure I'm not being fooled by the crossover components. Um, and sure enough, I've got an, an open circuit on, on the mid-range, uh, which means something has failed, likely in the voice coil. And here you can kind of get a better look at the voice coil, which is fairly complex. You can see that the connection for the mid-range comes in from the bottom and then goes up to the top and travels to the voice coil through one of the 12 panel segments with a very thin copper wire, the same voice coil wire in the winding um, epoxied or glued to the, to the surface and that's how it makes it down to the voice coil down below. It's an unusual configuration but what is necessary in order to make these sort of drivers work. And the same thing's repeated on the tweeter. You'll see here the tweeter connections leave this top ring go into the top of the unit and then travel down through one of the panels into the voice coil which sits at the bottom of the tweeter. So the bottom line is we've got on one of the speakers we've got a mid-range that has been blown likely to do some either overpowering or just a manufacturing failure and same with the tweeter. The tweeter is more likely to have been just blown by someone probably disconnecting an amplifier or a preamp or creating some sort of surge in the amplifier signal that would burn a voice coil. So I think that's it for the diagnostic part of the speaker. And now I've got to get the right parts and get this beautiful set back into business. All right, I'll report back once I know what, what's next.
Let's take a look at the owner's manual. There's some pretty interesting stuff in here. Uh, first, there's some mention on how to properly set up the speakers. Um, typical triangular configuration, equilateral. They do mention diffusers. You're utilis utilizing diffusers in the corners. Um, and they give you a pretty simple formula for figuring out your distances to the back wall and offset. So these speakers are pretty far into the room on most setups. As you can imagine, just by the design of the, the radiators. Um, in terms of connecting to an amplifier, they suggest, they don't recommend something specific, but they give you a couple options. One is using a mono amplifier. These are 911 MBL mono amplifiers. And this could be any brand. It doesn't have to be MBL. Um, and if you have a, a mono amplifier with two sets of outputs, uh, in parallel, you can bi-wire the speakers. So you send one set of outputs to the low drivers and the other set of outputs to the mids and highs. Um, so this is uh, a dual mono configuration, or just maybe not dual mono, just a mono configuration. Here we have um, stereo amplifiers powering the woofer and the mids and highs separately. So you would use your left output for the woofers and the right output for the mids and highs. This is a bi-amplification setup, um, what I call a horizontal bi-amplification, meaning that you're dedicating one amplifier per speaker in stereo, or let's say two channels of amplification per speaker. Now, if you imagine this could also be done the other way, where you stack these amplifiers, and one amplifier is responsible for both low outputs and the other amplifier is responsible for mids and highs, but they're recommending the horizontal method. This does require a preamp with dual sets of outputs. Here's the same configuration utilizing a pair of 8011 S's. So again, horizontal biamping. This is where it gets interesting. So the sound optimization uh, and adjustment of the radial strawler. So they're saying here that these adjusters that we've seen on the back of the speakers these guys here and utilize these uh, jumping pins don't actually affect the network or the crossover or the topology of, of the crossover that and they say uh, says caution the electrical data of the crossover network is the same in different positions only the molecular microstructure of its signal path is changed this is due to the use of different materials so I'm not quite sure what to make of that, but I think they're insinuating that the crossover design or the network is the same. You're just changing the, mo uh, the material uh, that is being routed through um, the signal path, which is, um, I'm curious to see what the differences are once we get these sorted out and are able to listen to them and compare the different settings. So the tweeter has a smooth, a natural, and a fast setting. The smooth is used to quiet electronic components that tend to hiss, while the natural is recommended for neutral high and electronics combined with sound neutral cables. I'm not sure what that means either. And the fast is recommended when the electronic components are weak in travel response. So how they attain this by changing the molecular structure of the signal path, I'd love to know. So we might have to take a look inside of the crossover. At the low range, low range, they're saying the smooth setting is recommended for well dampened acoustical dry rooms, while the attack is recommended where the bass tends to boom or seems to be too powerful. All right. Um, here they go on and about how to install the covers, which are fairly complex. Clean the system and the specifications in the back are interesting. It's a four-way speaker, if we've noted. Uh, the range is pretty stellar. It's 24 hertz to 40,000 hertz, which makes me think that this is probably more of a super tweeter than it is a conventional tweeter. That a lot of the upper frequencies are done by this upper mid range, and that for this to go all the way to 40,000 hertz, it's really impressive. Uh, we can't hear very much above 16,000 hertz, so I guess our pets will be enjoying the speakers at that frequency range. Uh, 24 hertz is really low for bass, so it's a sizable cabinet. If you remember, it uses a, a single large 
driver in it and uh, it is ported quite a bit so they're able to get down to 24 hertz which is impressive now this is where it gets complicated the SPL this, uh, is 82 dB per watt per meter so it's a very inefficient speaker it's going to take a lot of power to drive these properly and sure enough um, they do recommend uh, 320 watts to 500 watts now these came to us from a homeowner that was using a pair of 600 watt amplifiers and he was very happy with that so I suspect uh, 500 is going to be the sweet spot for these speakers. And then the crossover frequencies, um, if you look here, the tweeters crossed over 3,500 hertz. And that's what we discussed before. The crossover frequency between these two drivers is 3,500. 12-inch um, cone on the woofer. Uh, and then the weight, 80 kilograms, 176 pounds. So a pretty sizable speaker. So that's it. Um, we're going to go ahead and sort this out, and uh, hopefully the next time we, we connect, it'll be uh, under listening tests.